Dr. Corwin Sullivan, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Canada. You are a professor of vertebrate paleontology at the University of Alberta, Canada, as well as the curator of the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum. You study the evolution of fossil vertebrates, concentrating on dinosaurs, and you also research the origin of birds and flight, which is what we will be talking about today. So uh, how has your work been going recently, Corwin? I'm assuming, as with a lot of my guests, uh, you've not been able to get out into the field due to pandemic restrictions. Thanks very much for having me on Evolution Soup. Um, you're correct about my not being able to get into the field. The University of Alberta, where I work, didn't tell us that we couldn't do field work, but had to impose a number of um, restrictions, safety protocols, to mm. deal with the pandemic situation. And my collaborators and I decided that it was just going to be too onerous for a variety of reasons. Part of the problem is that my, my annual field work is in northern Alberta, and the field crew is actually quite international. We have a contingent mm. that comes over from Australia every year, and I have an Italian colleague who joins us as well. And international travel is problematic right now, to say the least. Oh, yeah. So because of that, and because of the way we would have had to actually operate in the field, um, we decided that this was a good year to just take off. And that actually isn't so bad, because we do have a backlog of fossils collected in previous field seasons to work on. And of course, we all have other projects to work on as well. So we've had things to do over the summer. And next year, we're hoping to get back at it in the usual way. Well, not long ago, I interviewed a student of yours, Michael Hudgens, on the origin of dinosaurs. Today, we're going to be diving into a much more specific area of dinosaur evolution, the origin of birds. But before that, let's just get a little bit of background on you. Corwin, did you always have an interest in dinosaurs and paleontology in general? Uh, yes, I saw a bit of Michael's interview. Uh, Michael's great, and I, I thought he did a really oh, nice yeah. job on your channel. Oh, uh, you. In terms of my background, um, apparently when I was two years old, I was telling people that I was going to be a paleontologist. Of course, in the like other children, I had dinosaur books and dinosaur toys in the house. And I spent a good part of my childhood in Toronto, where the Royal Ontario Museum is located. And I loved the museum. At the time I was a child, the paleontology galleries had a number of dioramas where they had skeletons of dinosaurs and other extinct vertebrates mounted against a painted background that would look like a, a mesozo, well, an, a scene from the geological past, sometimes with artificial plants and so on in the mix as well. So it really was like stepping into a prehistoric world. And that fascinated me, um, as did the things I was reading about extinct life in, in the books I had. And I was able to do a little bit of fossil collecting just in southern Ontario, mm -hmm. finding uh, ancient marine invertebrates. And then uh, later on, my family moved to the west coast of Canada, to uh, Victoria. And around there, there were... Uh, it was possible to find marine fossils, marine invertebrate fossils again, um, from both the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic. So as a teenager in Victoria, I got a little bit more serious about fossil collecting. And of course, when you're growing up, you have different interests. There was a time when I thought I wanted to be an astronomer and a time when mm -hmm. I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist. And every so often I would think about becoming a writer, but paleontology was the thing that I kept going back to. And as a teenager, I also discovered the writings of Stephen Jay Gould, who was, was an American paleontologist uh, who worked on invertebrates primarily, but wrote a lot about paleontology and especially about the relationship between paleontology and evolutionary theory. Oh, yeah. And Gould in particular, but also other popular writers about paleontology and evolution, convinced me that paleontology wasn't just about running around finding fossils, that it was a discipline that had some real intellectual weight to it and a real theoretical side. So that helped me make up my mind that I actually did want a career in paleontology. And uh, luckily enough, it worked out.
Well, the origin of birds is quite a complex one, but when people think of dinosaurs and birds, the first creature that usually comes to mind is Archaeopteryx, a Jurassic animal with both reptilian and avian features, first discovered in Germany in 1861. Corwin, why was Archaeopteryx so significant, and how has the scientific consensus on this animal changed over the years? Well, Archaeopteryx is absolutely iconic. And one of the interesting things about it, as you say, it has a very clear mixture, or at least clear to modern paleontologists, of mm. avian features and what you could think of as primitive, or we say plesiomorphic, reptilian features. So it has well-developed feathers, clearly adapted for flight like birds, but it also has teeth, which are proverbially non-existent in modern birds, um, and, for, and a long bony tail, for example. So it looks like, in some sense, something between a bird and a standard reptile. But uh, the, the first skeletal specimen of Archaeopteryx to be collected is the so-called London specimen, which was purchased by the Natural History Museum on the side of the pond where you are. Yeah, and I've seen it, it many was, times. <laughs> yes, and it was the subject of early papers by Richard Owen, who was a, a great paleontologist and anatomist, but a skeptic of evolution and in some sense Charles Darwin's enemy. And also by Thomas Huxley, who was a great believer in Darwin's evolution, in evolution and Darwin's friend. And <clears throat> neither Owen nor Huxley um, really bought into the idea of Archaeopteryx as a transitional form. They both saw it as a, as a bird with some unusual characteristics, which Huxley interpreted as primitive and Owen as just archaic. Um, so, so they didn't really see it as being on some dividing line between birds and reptiles. Um, but that gradually shifted as uh, more specimens of Archaeopteryx were discovered. To be fair, the London specimen was quite incomplete. Mm. So as the anatomy of Archaeopteryx became better known, um, and the fossil record in general became better known, uh, it started to become clear to paleontologists that Archaeopteryx really was right on the cusp of a major evolutionary transition to birds. And for a long time, it was the only thing that was really in that phylogenetic position that was close to either side of that dividing line. So the debate about the origin of birds became a debate about what Archaeopteryx was related to, and the debate about the origin of flight became, in large measure, a, a debate about how Archaeopteryx lived and how it might have moved through the air. Um, and the consensus for a long time was that Archaeopteryx was a representative of a lineage that had appeared in the Triassic um, separate from dinosaurs and separate from crocodilians and the pterosaurs, flying reptiles that are not mm -hmm. dinosaurs but are closely related to dinosaurs. Um, so Archaeopteryx was considered separate from all these groups and the descendant of some kind of unknown ancestor um, back in the Triassic. And it was only towards the end of the 20th century that uh, John Ostrom, who was uh, famously also the discoverer of the theropod dinosaur Deinonychus, uh, worked out that Opteryx was in fact a modified sort of theropod. Theropods, of course, being the bipedal meat-eating dinosaurs, such mm -hmm. as Tyrannosaurus rex, which we all know and love. Um, so that was a major shift in the perception of Archaeopteryx that had gone from being the descendant of some unknown Triassic reptile to actually a dinosaur and indeed a theropod dinosaur. Uh, and then more recently, there was another shift, which I think is also quite important, um, in that um, we began to discover more things that were essentially transitional forms close to the origin mm -hmm. of birds, uh, especially in China, but to some extent in other parts of the world too. So our knowledge of that transition really started to fill in. And that meant that Archaeopteryx wasn't standing alone as the transitional form associated with the origin of birds, but was just one among many. And of course, it, it still retains huge historical and iconic importance. It also retains a lot of scientific importance in that it is usually, usually regarded, and I think reasonably regarded, as the most primitive bird that we know, and is also a fairly well-represented member of that transition, in that we have about a dozen skeletons, some of them are relatively complete, and the, the skeletal anatomy and to some extent the plumage of Archaeopteryx are known in a lot of detail. So it remains extremely important, but it is no longer in splendid isolation as a representative of the transition.
Now, you spent nearly 10 years in China working with people like Xu Xing, who is an expert on feathered dinosaurs. Now, China seems to be the hotspot for the discovery of these ancient winged reptiles. So what can you tell us about working in China on feathered dinosaurs and what the research situation is like there today? Yes, I did spend uh, nearly 10 years working in China at what's called the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing, mm -hmm. part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences system. And working there was a, a tremendous pleasure and, and really a tremendous privilege. Um, China is a geographically large country, one of the geographically largest countries in the world. And in a lot of places, it has sedimentary rock that um, preserve various kinds of extinct life. The Chinese fossil record is enormously varied. It's got things that go back to the very dawn of multicellular life, and it's got Ice Age mammals and early humans, and everything in between. And for dinosaurs and their relatives, which is primarily what I'm interested in, you can find early Jurassic dinosaurs uh, down in Yunnan province in the south, um, there are important fossils in Sichuan province near Yunnan, and uh, also, for example, in Xinjiang up in the northwest, where mm -hmm. uh, the early Tyrannosauroid Guanlong comes from and the early Ceratopsian Yinlong. Um, and then in Inner Mongolia, the part of China that's adjacent to the country of Mongolia, um, there are wonderful Cretaceous fossils out in the Gobi Desert, and there are plenty of other examples. But the jewel, I would say, is the lake deposits of northeast China, which are very interesting because they're geologically unusual. In most, most settings, most depositional environments, um, we only find bones and teeth, the hard tissues of the vertebrate body. We don't find associated soft tissues. And there also tends to be what we call a taphonomic bias against small vertebrates, meaning that their skeletons are unlikely to survive. The bones of small vertebrates are, of course, quite delicate. Mm -hmm. So in most settings, they tend to break apart quite badly before they can enter the fossil record. So you find fragments, if anything. But in some depositional environments, such as these lakes that existed in northeast China during the Mesozoic, small vertebrate skeletons remain intact and also are often preserved with their soft tissue. And of course, early birds and their close relatives among what we call non-avian theropod dinosaurs um, would have been small. So the lake hmm. deposits of northeast China preserve a lot of early birds, a lot of non-avian theropods closely related to birds, and provide an amazing window into the transition. And in fact, in detail, they provide two windows, because some of those deposits are from close to the timeline between the mid and late Jurassic, and some are from the early Cretaceous, tens of millions of years. So we can see what was going on with non-avian theropods close to the origin of birds in the Jurassic and then in that same part of the world, um, thanks to the same depositional situation, we can see what was going on with early birds and many surviving non-avian theropods uh, in the early Cretaceous. So China gives us an enormous amount of information about that transition. And another thing about working in China, the infrastructure is getting better all the time, so it's possible to get to field sites in different parts of China much more easily than was the case, say, 30 or 40 years ago. And uh, the Chinese government is also quite serious about supporting basic science. So uh, China is an amazing place to do vertebrate paleontology. And I expect it's going to continue to be a hotbed of exciting discoveries for many years and decades to come. Okay, let's get into the origin of birds. So this, of course, includes the origin of feathers as well as the origin of flight within reptiles. So let's just start with feathers. Corwin, what exactly are feathers and just how far back in time do they go? Well, feathers are integumentary structures, so structures associated with the skin that grow from follicles like mammalian hair and are made of a protein called beta keratin, which is related to but chemically distinct from the alpha keratin that forms our hair and fingernails, for example. Uh. Right. So keratin in general is quite amazing 
stuff. And of course, it's somewhat varied in its material properties, right? Hair and fingernails are quite different, even though they're both made from keratin. And on the body of a bird, the scales on its legs and the feathers that cover much of its body are both beta keratin, even though they're quite different from each other as well. But keratin can at least be both stiff and lightweight, and that makes it an ideal material for forming feathers that can be used in flight. Now, it seems hmm. feathers in their original form, in fact, it's quite clear that feathers in their original form um, didn't evolve for flight because they weren't structurally suited to it. The uh, most plesiomorphic or primitive feathers that we see in the fossil record are what are often referred to as filamentous feathers, meaning they're more like little hairs or bristles, or in some cases, clusters of bristles, right. um, than they are like the panaceous feathers of a modern bird. So the original purpose of these feathers might have been something like insulation or changing the appearance of the body, whether that was for display to attract a mate, for example, or for something like camouflage. It's, it's hard to know. Hmm. But their original function had to be something non-aerodynamic because they were filamentous structures that couldn't have formed aerodynamic surfaces. The question of, of how far back they go in time is interesting. Hmm. We can say that definitely Feathers were present in many theropods, um, going all the way back to probably around the beginning of the Middle Jurassic. So uh, that's well before the origin of birds. And we're talking, I think, about 175 million years or so ago in geological time. Um, and that's, that's a pretty firm estimate for a minimum origination time for feathers based on the specimens we have and what we know about the phylogeny of theropods. But there are also feather-like structures uh, in Ornithischian dinosaurs, some structures that resemble filamentous feathers in a few taxa, and pterosaurs, which are closely related to dinosaurs, uh, often have hair-like structures associated with their wings, um, which again bears some resemblance to the filamentous feathers of early uh, non-avian theropods that do show do show feathering. So, going out a, on a limb, one could speculate, and it really is speculation, that the hair-like structures in pterosaurs and the filamentous feathers seen in early non-avian theropods evolved from some kind of common ancestral structure, so that the common ancestor of dinosaurs and pterosaurs would have been feathered, and that ancestor would undoubtedly have lived well back into the Triassic, so that would extend the origin of feathers beyond ah. 200 million years. Um, wow. But that really is speculation, and the earliest things that we can say definitely had feathers that have an evolutionary relationship with the feathers of modern birds um, are relatively basal theropod dinosaurs, um, famously represented, for example, by Sinoceropteryx, which was the first third dinosaur to come out of the Chinese fossil record and uh, is a small relative of Compsognathus from Germany. And, and some Sinoceropteryx specimens have very clear, short, filamentous feathers covering much of the body. This stuff is sometimes referred to as dino fuzz because it would have made <laughs> the dinos look fuzzy. Right. Okay, that's really interesting. And just to be clear, Corwin, um, a sauropod, for instance, a four-footed uh, creature probably wouldn't have had these filaments, or or would they? Um, might have it. It depends. It depends on again how the how the evolutionary relationship between the feathers of theropod dinosaurs and these other feather-like structures are interpreted, um, because if um, if pterosaur feather-like structures, or even the feather-like structures we see in a few Ornithischians, evolved from the same ancestral structure as theropod feathers, then you have to think that feathers are just a dinosaurian feature, or even perhaps a dinosaur plus pterosaur feature, and that they would have been present in the common ancestor of dinosaurs, and then inherited by early members of dinosaurian lineages. Whether they mm. disappeared later in the evolution of some of those lineages is another question. But if you believe that Ornithischian 
feathers, let's say, and uh, theropod feathers have a common evolutionary origin, or in other words, that they're homologous, as we sometimes say, then it's certainly possible that sauropod dinosaurs would have had some kind of feathering as well. But we can't say that that's the case. We don't have any direct evidence of it. And this, in general, points to an issue in paleontology where, of course, despite the wonderful material that we get from Northeast China and, um, and Germany in the case of Archaeopteryx and a few other places, typically we don't find feathers or soft tissues um, associated with vertebrate skeletons. We only find the bones and teeth, so it's very hard to reconstruct what their integument was like. We do have some skin impressions from dinosaurs of various mm. kinds, and most of those skin impressions, for example, the ones that we have for um, tyrannosaurs from the late Cretaceous, um, show scales and don't show feathers. But yes. it's not entirely clear to me that you would see feather impressions in that situation, right? Perhaps the feathers dropped off before the impression formed or, so, or something along those lines. So I don't think we can rule out the presence of feathers in those animals either. It's just something that's very hard to get from the fossil record. So what about the beginnings of pinaceous feathers? These, of course, are the barbed feathers that we see today on modern birds. So when did they evolve? Yes, uh, well, pinaceous feathers um, are characteristic of birds and their close relatives. Um, for example, the dromaeosaurid non-avian theropods, um, such as Deinonychus, which John Ostrom described, um, such as Velociraptor of Jurassic Park fame, um, and also such as Utah Raptor, which is like a, a larger cousin of Deinonychus and Velociraptor. Um, and there are, of course, some other non-avian theropods closely related to birds as well. And all these taxa would have shared pinaceous feathers, which, as you say, um, are, are the feather type seen in modern birds. They're, they're barbed, they're somewhat blade-like, and importantly, pinaceous feathers are capable of forming aerodynamic surfaces. Uh, the oldest evidence we have for them is from the lake deposits of northeast China, um, and, is, and that's about 160 million years old. So back in the Jurassic, uh, well before Archaeopteryx, but well after the um, latest, what I would call the latest possible origination time of filamentous feathers. And the original function of pinaceous feathers is uh, difficult to uh, difficult to establish. Um, pinaceous feathers are suitable for flight, but it's likely that they were first used for something else. Right. Corin, what is the thinking now on how and why flight evolved in these reptiles? If feathered wings evolved first and flight later, what was the initial purpose of wings? Yes, well, that's an interesting question. And um, something that's still very much under investigation. Um, we know that pinaceous feathers, uh, which formed wing -like structures uh, on, on the forelimbs of these dinosaurs, these theropods closely related to birds, weren't initially used for flight. And the reason we can be at least fairly sure of that um, has to do with a group of dinosaurs called the Ovaraptorosauria. Um, of which uh, Ava Mimas, for example, from the late Cretaceous of Mongolia, mm -hmm. is a good example. Um, many of many of these Ovaraptorosaurs are known from late Cretaceous specimens that only preserve skeletal features, so we can't tell what their integument was like. But there's an early Ovaraptorosaur called Caudipteryx from mm -hmm. the early Cretaceous lake deposits of China. And Caudipteryx is an Ovaraptorosaur that, for one thing, had pinaceous feathers forming wing-like structures on the forelimbs and also uh, on the tail, which is why it's called Caudipteryx. That essentially means tail wing. Um, and Caudipteryx was also, although it was a relatively small Ovaraptorosaur, kind of turkey-sized, perhaps, uh, it was clearly unsuitable in terms of its size and its body proportions for moving through the air. Um, e even with much larger wings, it's hard to imagine, or, or larger feathers at least, it's hard to imagine Caudipteryx um, moving, moving through the air, either flapping or gliding, because it was a, it was a stocky little dinosaur with short forelimbs. So that suggests, and Ovaraptorosaurs are also the most primitive group of dinosaurs uh, within Pen Peneraptera to have pinaceous feathers. So if we assume 
that oviraptorosaurs uh, didn't evolve from some kind of flying ancestor, right? Which mm-hmm. which seems unlikely. Then panaceous feathers must have uh, evolved for a purpose other than flight, and possibilities include. Um, sexual display, which is actually the one I'd favor, or at least some kind of ornamentation, some kind of visual signaling. Um, But it's also possible that feathers were used somehow in assisting with locomotion on land. That that is, that these wing-like structures were generating small aerodynamic forces that would have been useful in behaviors like braking or turning or running uphill or climbing over obstacles. Um, just in a terrestrial context. And there have been more exotic suggestions like use of feathers in, in brooding behavior. Um, but I would I would guess that it was either sexual display or assisting with terrestrial locomotion or some combination of the two. And uh, display seems to me the more likely thing. Um, but it's a very hard question to test. And I should say that we're inhibited here by not knowing what the earliest oviraptorosaurs were actually like. Caudipteryx is from the early Cretaceous, but it's clear from the phylogeny of theropods that the oviraptorosaur lineage must go well back into the Jurassic. We just don't have any Jurassic oviraptorosaurs to tell us about the early evolution of that particular group. So it is just possible that the common ancestor of all peneraptorans, including oviraptorosaurs, had some kind of aerial capability and evolved panaceous feathers for that purpose. But we just don't know because we don't have a Jurassic oviraptorosaur record. Corwin, flight has evolved in so many animals, insects, mammals, such as the flying squirrel, even fish and snakes fly and glide. So flight in dinosaurs isn't too surprising, really. There are a lot of arguments surrounding just how these early reptiles evolved their flying habits. Could it have been a case of, I don't know, simply running along the ground and leaping into the air or uh, how might it have worked (laughs) uh well that's that's been suggested um i think first proposed by uh by notcha who was a a european paleontologist from the early 20th century but uh elaborated later by john ostrom um was that there was some sort of theropod dinosaur that was um a predator on insects and would chase insects around on the ground, but sometimes leap into the air to go after them. If the leaps could be prolonged and some kind of aerial maneuverability could be developed, then of course the animal would be able to actually chase insects through the air. So that would create an evolutionary impetus, Mm -hmm. what we call a selection pressure, um, for the development of better leaping and perhaps flapping ability. The other possibility, and that's referred to it often as a ground up scenario of evolution. The other possibility is what's known as a trees down scenario. And that and that would involve a early theropod, well, close to the origin of birds, uh, climbing around in the trees and perhaps leaping occasionally from tree to tree to escape a predator or mm. just to continue foraging on another tree. And once again, in that situation, being able to extend leaps, so a selection pressure for the origin of flight um, would exist. Perhaps 20 or 30 years ago, um, that, was a, that, that was a real area of concentration um, for people who studied the origin of flight, whether whether flight evolved from the ground up or trees down um, was a big deal and was widely discussed in the literature. Knowledge of the transition has filled in, and we've become aware that it was a lot more complicated than that. It, well, it's likely that flight um, evolved in rudimentary form in early birds or something close to birds, and then became refined over tens of millions of years. And that refinement might have happened in different settings. It's possible that if you were to start with a non-flying theropod and trace its lineage all the way into birds, that along that lineage you would have had some things that lived on the ground, some things that lived primarily in the trees, uh, some things that did a bit of both. And it's also possible that flight actually evolved multiple times in birds and their close relatives. For example, um, we know that some dromaeosaurid theropods Uh, in a group called the Microraptorinae, of which Microraptor is uh, the most famous representative, 
um, were almost certainly capable of at least gliding, possibly flapping uh, through the air. Microraptor is a Chinese, a Chinese theropod that is famous for having feathers uh, not only on its forelimbs, but also on its hind limbs. So in a sense, it had four wing-like surfaces to move through the air with. And you could even say five wing-like surfaces because there are also um, panaceous feathers on the tail of Microraptor. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's possible, of course, that Microraptor and birds had a common ancestor that was already capable of flying, but it's also possible that Microraptor evolved flight independently from mm -hmm. birds. And there are other examples of taxa close to the origin of birds that may have got into the air separately. So there could have been a few origins of flight, perhaps some in the trees and some on the ground. Um, I would guess actually that it was probably mostly in the trees simply because it seems easier and more natural to evolve flight in cooperation with gravity, in a sense, than working against gravity, um, right? Getting into the air uh, for a proto-flyer chasing insects would presumably have taken a lot of energy and just seems like the more, the more difficult and less intuitively reasonable uh, way to do things. But that's, that's a pretty flimsy argument based perhaps on personal prejudice. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. I just wondering about uh, flapping, would that have been a, a trial and error over a long period of time? Um, I think I think flapping would have had to evolve through, yeah, some kind of trial and error process initially, because um, everything more or less does. That, that's how evolution mm -hmm. operates. Evolution does its best with what's available and is very improvisational. Um, I suspect, for what it's worth, that the first things close to close to the origin of birds that moved through the air um, weren't doing so in a particularly sophisticated way. There is debate about whether they were flapping or gliding, but I think it's important to realize that if they were flapping, they wouldn't have been doing so with anything like the sophistication of a modern bird. If they were gliding, they probably weren't doing so with the sophistication that we see in flying squirrels, for example. Today, there would have been an early period in which they were in a sense, figuring figuring it out. And I think in that case, they were probably moving through the air quite clumsily, probably extending a jump more than anything else, or perhaps even just parachuting more, gen more gently to the ground than would have been possible without panaceous feathers. And there could have been elements of flapping, elements of gliding, um, elements of, of desperate flailing that, um, yeah. that were involved in the locomotion and that could then be refined, and I would think quickly refined, in their subsequent evolution. Well, we could go into so much more detail on this incredible subject. It's certainly one of my favorite topics, and I'm really grateful that you've been able to give us some of your time today. I will leave links to your ResearchGate page, as well as social media, in the description below. And hopefully, you can come back on Devolution Soup again one day in the very near future. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure.